The voice of Sherry. Do you understand? Hi, welcome to Durian ASEAN. Now, today we have our guest, uh, Esan Hassan, and he's from Buku Jalanan or Street Book. Am I right? Ah, sort of. Hello. <laughs> so, welcome to uh, Durian ASEAN for today's uh, segment on t- uh, the culture of reading. And Buku Jalanan has done tremendously in terms of promoting grassroots uh, reading among the local communities. First of all, who are the people behind Buku Jalanan? Um, Buku Jalanan uh, mostly uh, run by young people who uh, want to uh, bring the culture of reading into their own local communities. So they're mostly students um, who study in their uh, ref- respective cities, in w- wherever the different Buku Jalanan is uh, located. I, I should say Buku Jalanan is actually a, a sort of street library it's also a collective where uh, they they run autonom- uh, autonomously uh, and independently from each other. So, uh, for example, uh, the Buku Jalanan that I'm from, uh, the library uh, operates in Shah Alam, in Tasik Shah Alam. And we have a library at the Lake Gardens every two weeks. And we bring books uh, to be borrowed and... Uh, to be borrowed for free with no bureaucracy. So people just write their name and phone number and they can take the book home. And then they would have so to return they, it. So they just uh, do like that without any like accountability whether the book will be written no. safely? No. Uh, why, why is that culture being instilled in uh, Buku Jalanan? Uh, what we believe in is uh, we believe in uh, putting in trust mm-hmm. and we also believe in um, uh, making people participate in responsibility and accountability. So it's not something pushed from the top. Mm. So if they want to return it, they return it out of their own free will. So how many percentage of the book actually being written? <laughs> uh, we, we don't have a percentage, but we do have books which are not written. And I think this is a reflection of some of the more, uh, the, the negative side of uh, this kind of initiative. Some people take, take it for granted. But uh, I must also stress that a tremendous amount of people uh, who came and participated in Bukujanan uh, uh, were very positive, returned the books and returned it in good order. Mm-hmm. So who are the founders actually of Bukujalanan? Bukujalanan was founded in Shah Alam by uh, three uh, young students at the time, uh, Zikri, uh, Idham and Azri. They were students at University Technology Mara, Shah Alam. And they decided that um, they wanted to do something to contribute to society and they were also influenced by uh, the Occupy movements and um, other uh, uh, leftist ideas as well. So they feel like they need to do some direct action and how to make uh, their local community, which is in Shah Alam, better. So uh, they, w- they saw the idea from uh, an initiative in America, a street library. Mm. So they wanted to bring it to Shah Alam. So the the word Buku Jalanan is literally called Street Library. Street Library, yeah. Mm-hmm. But rather than uh, translate it like literally into uh, Pobustakaan Jalanan, um, I think the founders wanted something a bit more... Hippish. <laughs> yeah, hippish if you like. <laughs> I see. So uh, how how did the Buku Jalanan started by just uh, three person, right? Um yes to uh, something spread it all around Malaysia. How did oh. it happen? Even in Sabah, Sarawak? Yes, that's mm-hmm. correct. Yeah. So now we have over 50 different locations in Malaysia uh, and also um, uh, and what we love about it is that uh, none of it was organised by the people who started it. it uh, the idea just spread and people just took on the brand and the way we operate and did it themselves in their own local communities, in their own cities. So this happened in the major cities first of uh, Peninsular Malaysia. And then it was taken up by uh, the small towns and then it spread into uh, Borneo. Uh, actually, some of, some of the cities in Borneo um, were, were one of the earliest to take up the idea. And, but the, the modus operandi is almost the same. All this Buku Jalanan were all st- almost all started by students 
and they would take up a very prominent part of the city, like a waterfront or a, a city park or a city square to uh, to promote the idea of a uh, street library. Mm-hmm. Uh, in uh, the different areas uh, or where Buku Jalanan exists, where do, you, do they get the books? Um, Almost, almost like how uh, the Buku Jalanan in Shah Alam started, it started with the, their own books. It always started with that, but after a while, as it grows in momentum, people start to donate their own books, and that's when the library grow. And in Shah Alam, uh, the first Buku Jalanan, our library has become so big that we have to. Uh, to have your own library. <laughs> yes, we have to have like a, a real a library, real library <laughs> a permanent library in Padang Jawa where we keep all our books. So from there, we take our books out and then bring it to our uh, open area. So um, at, let's say I'm interested to borrow a book at uh, f- uh, at the Buku Jalanan there. How can I do that? Uh, you just have to attend and then you pick up a book that you like. You tell the one of the librarians and your name and your phone number will be taken. And that's it. You can you can. Is that Padang Jawa there? Is at Tasik. Oh, Sha'alam. Tasik Shalam. Yeah, Lake Gardens. And it it is open every day or only uh, on certain days? It's open only on Saturday, every two weeks. Mm-hmm. So, um, who are the target readers that actually you want to focus? Um, we have. I'm sure a lot of people actually do read, but mm. your main target. Um, the. It's hard for me to give like a very generalized target audience for all buku jalanan, uh, but there are several several types of buku jalanan. Like the buku jalanan, like uh, like ours, we are based in a, a community area, so our main target would be uh, the mass public who would use the park, and people who don't normally uh, bring their family to libraries. So um, there's another one. Um, which is in universities. So these are uh, buku jalanan which targets people who already read a lot. Uh, students read a lot, a lot of textbooks. But so this kind of uh, buku jalanan in universities, they they would uh, target students and students with uh, with some sort of activist uh, activistic um, sort of tendencies. Mm-hmm. So there's another one as well, which is uh, run by families. So these are very uh, uh, community-based and probably peop- just people that they know. And I see. <laughs> so uh, it, it's quite interesting that uh, you are trying to do this uh, as in like based on the idea of grassroots movement rather than you know forming an institution or a, a real library in in this sense. But do you really partner with any institution? Or it's just uh, Buku Jalanan on its own t- as a grassroots movement? We collaborated with so many people over the years. And the the different Buku Jalanan, they take up their own initiative to um, collaborate with organisations that, they, that, uh, that they are comfortable with. So for us in Shah Alam, we collaborated uh, with uh, uh, a multi-faith organisation, for example, called Project Dialogue. And then uh, in in KL in Tasik Titiwangsa, they collaborated with the National Arts Museum, which is just next door to them, and and some places uh, partnered with uh, the uh, universities like UTM and University of Malaya. So they, 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 there's different ways to collaborate, and I think collaboration has always been the most important aspect of Buku Jalanan because it cannot uh, stand on its own. It Depends on collaboration and cooperation. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about the culture of reading. Why, why in Buku Jalanan you think that instilling the culture of reading is very important? It's extremely important. I think uh, reading is a is a, an act of liberation. Mm-hmm. It's a it makes a human being whole, and without uh, the culture of literature, uh, of reflection, of speculation. I think uh, human beings will become mere uh, technocrats and robots, and and when you become robots and technocrats, that's when uh, the value of democracy is diminished. Mm-hmm. So this is where the 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 philosophy comes from, if you like. Uh, looking 
uh, speaking more scientifically, you, if you look at a study by uh, the National Library of Malaysia, in 1996, uh, they released a report saying that uh, the average Malaysian reads two pages a year. And I think it's a reflection of the kind of democracy that we have. We, um, and also a reflection of the kind of discussions about politics that we have or discussion about um, rights, justice. This is a reflection of our political leaders as yes, well. Yes, <laughs> definitely, definitely. Usually, political leaders of any society, they usually come from the worst of the society. And <laughs> and our our leaders just shows that, that kind of animalistic uh, tendencies and barbarity that, that just... Uh, so reflective or very unliterary society. Mm-hmm. I I'm interested to know about why books, like as in physical form of books and papers, because in today's society where everyone relies on internet for almost everything, you can simply get an ebook anywhere, even for free. Why you still need to have this uh, buku jalanan in a way? That's true. I think um, I think it's something that all buku jalanan should uh, reflect on. Mm-hmm. Um, we must uh, interact with technology. Uh, but at the same time, I think um, the, the so-called e-book revolution never really took off. Um, books are still being sold and a lot of people still prefer holding it on the, in their hands. And, uh, but at the same time, we shouldn't discount e-book because e-book is extremely accessible, easily copied and it's an important tool and aspect about literature that we should, we should use. Um, yeah, that's mm. what, that's what I'm uh, another interesting um, uh, survey that was being done by our national library is uh, although you stated that uh, people read uh, two pages per year in 1996, but interestingly, the latest survey in 2010 is stated that people actually read eight to twelve books a year, and that's a lot. I mean, to say it's Malaysian standard to me, that's a lot. Do, do you really think that young people actually they have gained their interest in reading? Um, I, especially in the urban areas, uh, you can see a surge in interest in reading. And uh, this also reflects in the surge of independent um, uh, publishers and um, the so-called indie books in Malay literature now. And oh, a revival for... Uh, the love of our um, older authors, if you like, in the 60s or something like that. And I think it's good, but... Um, Does it really reflect the whole of Malaysian society? It, it doesn't. I think mm-hmm. it, it doesn't. Um, it's a very urban phenomenon. Mm-hmm. And we the the report that was done in um, uh, Pustaka Negara at the National Library, I think they did not take into consideration uh, socio-economic backgrounds. Mm-hmm. I think when we start to look at that, we will realize there's a, maybe the culture of reading is actually becoming more pronounced, but maybe it's becoming in smaller and smaller hands, and that is quite uh, dangerous. I think we don't. Um, then we will create an elitist uh, sort of. Exactly. Uh, social class instead yeah. of having uh, reading. I mean, the culture of having democratized to everyone, isn't it? There's nothing more dangerous than an elitist. Literary mm. uh, s- ruling elite. <laughs> That's what I think. <laughs> I see. But uh, I mean, t- t- talking about young people of today, um, whether they are interested or not interested in reading, do you think another problem of why young people, uh, they, have, they, they, they have very oblivious or oblivious view about uh, the culture of reading, it is also because of the government, as in like government banning books, censoring books, and also... Uh, in a certain sense, the accessibility of certain books is not there. Like you go to MPH bookstore, if you go to the Malay section, I don't think you can hardly find any good materials of diverse topics on different themes. Mm. Um, we in Bukit Jalan, we normally do not see it as a. I think it's unfair to blame um, the young, the youth, for their lack of appreciation of. Malay, Malay literature, for example. Um, because um, for us in Buku Jana, a lot of us are recent converts into Malay literature or literature in general. So what we find is that 
we want to share our experience of discovering literature and loving it and uh, putting it into our own lives. So what we feel is that one of the main reasons why people are not interested in literature is that they do not see uh, the relevance of literature in their daily lives. And that's a problem. So how we do it is buku in every, is almost buku, uh, every other buku jalanan, almost, sorry, in almost every buku jalanan, we have a session called a Bedah Buku, uh, mm-hmm. book review. And these book reviews are really important because uh, only when you hear books being debated, their contents being um, interpreted and made relevant into daily life, then you can see how it is connected to your lives. Uh, just take like um, one book uh, that really changed many perceptions of people. When uh, we say hikayat nowadays, uh, because a lot of people think it's uh, an old story, uh, superstitious Malay <laughs> folk tales, but we had this um, hikayat Munshi Abdullah written by a, by a Munshi Abdullah, which is uh, the first modern Malay writer. When it was discussed and when it was interpreted and when it was uh, revealed to many people in our book review that it was the first book in Malay writing, in Malay language, that used the word I. Oh, that put interesting. the author in the center of the narrative. Oh, really? In the past, uh, it's always the third party? In the past, the stories are always about other people. Ah. Like the stories of princess pin, uh, and princesses or gods or... Oh, oh, so he's the first one to be more existentialist, yeah, <laughs> talking about himself. Yeah. The, the existence of an author mm-hmm. and how uh, he, how that kind of hikayat, which is still written in a kind of uh, sort of still coloured by the classical ways of telling stories, is extremely modern and is written in the 1800s. I see. So when after, after we discussed that, we realised that the, a lot of people were interested in Munshi Abdullah and his other works. And I think that's... And finding relevance in it. Like, what does it mean to be Malay? Some people were asking. Because mm-hmm. Munshi Abdullah had such a cosmopolitan background. So... So to reinterpret, you know, what is it to yeah. be your own yeah. identity that yeah. you always uh, associate it with something yeah. else? Yeah. And it's so... It's, it's so much... Uh, better than telling people read Hikayat Munshi Abdullah. Uh-huh. I guess that kind of culture of you must do this, you must do that it is instilled probably prior to when, I mean, probably during our days where we are growing up, you know, in in the education system itself, like everything is being about we have to do this because it will benefit us rather than finding meaning of why we are doing this after all. Yeah. But has has this culture actually uh, shape the worldview of a lot of the youngsters today as in like they believe maybe I have to do this that's why I need to do this but uh, I don't really see the relevance of doing this I mean in that sense um, because there's no teacher or lecturer to force you to read uh, whatever hikayat or whatever books you know for any exam so maybe youngsters of today don't see relevance on it but do you think you can reverse this in a way? I mean, mm-hmm. this kind of mindset. And I how think, would it be? Yes, I think it's important that uh, uh, enlightened people all across our society uh, fight this kind of culture of um, doing something only for some sort of self-benefit like um, exam marks or uh, your A stars and things like that. We, we should really fight that culture. Because but when, when when people has been so institutionalized under one system, how do they fight it? I mean, what kind of new idea that we should bring forth, new kind of thinking? Um, it's up to, I think what Buku Jalanan tries to do is uh, we fight it through showing that literature can be interesting and fun and not uh, dumbing it down. I think that's important as well. But we have to be innovative in uh, bringing... Uh, this kind of ideas into people who might be sceptical or unreceptive in the beginning. But at the same time, I think maybe some people will not like it, but it's fine. Like you, you can't turn everyone into uh, like the into a, lit, a literary person. Any like, any interesting story that you I mean you found during your time at Buku Jalanan 
I mean, on young people who maybe initially they might be a bit, I don't know, uh, not really sure about this kind of culture of reading. But after going through all the activities within Kujalanan and he became a convert, he or she. <laughs> no, I think... Uh, we normally the people who came to Buku Jalanan are already very receptive. I see. Uh, to the idea of okay, I want to open up to new kinds of reading or mm. new kinds of ideas, and we always review very controversial books. Uh, firstly, to bring the crowd, but I think also the books that we chose are very relevant to our society. What kind uh, of themes? I mean, for example, just uh, several weeks ago, we uh, reviewed. Uh, a Malay translation of the Communist Manifesto by uh, Karl Marx and uh, Engels. So uh, those those kind of uh, book reviews bring a lot of people and a lot of people were interested in it. So a lot of people do that, uh, sorry, came with already the intention of learning something new. Mm. But um, maybe uh, the the more skeptical or uh, people are usually the passerbys who see us who saw us and would just uh, drop by and started listening to all these crazy things that we <laughs> talk about and started to like question us. But we always welcome those people and think they might not be converted into like uh, into communists or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but at least uh, we believe the process of dialogue has already started. Mm-hmm. They saw us in a public space discussing something that they feel uncomfortable with and maybe one day they would interact with that dialogue with us and mm-hmm. Uh, maybe we would learn from them. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the key uh, feature of Buku Jalanan, which I'm interested uh, is you actually uh, promote the Malay language to the public, not just as a language of uh, discussion, but as a real language that people need to appreciate its uh, you know, uh, uniqueness and beauty. So uh, why you do that? Um, of, of late, we noticed that um, English has taken mm-hmm. over Malay as a language of descent, as a language of um, the, mar- uh, the the fight for justice. And I think this is quite a new phenomenon and it shows like a shift um, in our society. So the urban middle class are taking over. Yeah, the, even the policies the, that is being debated in terms of uh, education is either you have the Malay or the English yeah. Like, I, I, why it has to be contested in that yeah. way, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I, actually, we believe um, to uh, promote change, to create change in society, the Malay language is extremely strategic. So we do not come from a nationalistic or ethno national, um, like. So you are different from Pekasa, is that what yeah, you're saying? Yeah, we're not Pekasa. <laughs> we're not, we don't come from <laughs> ethnic pride. Oh. Um, so what we're saying is Malay is, a, is spoken by almost everyone in this country, regardless of their social status. And it's understood by so many people and it's a mother tongue of oh, at least 60% of this country. I think it's more. So it's, it's one of the most strategic languages in this country. But what happens is that English is being used by many activists. So we feel like that that is how the disconnect has happened. And... And not just the rhetorics. I, I think the more the most important aspect of uh, the wave of change is that all, a lot of the discussions, the discourse, the forums are all conducted in English. Mm-hmm. Well, not all, but mostly conducted in English. And we feel, um, and there are forums conducted in Malay, but they do not have the same kind of uh, the same level of uh, discourse that the one in English has. So what we wanted to do is we want to use Malay as a language of discourse and make it a, a point and wherever we uh, organize events, use uh, Malay and show that Malay can be uh, a, not just a, a useful language but a very appropriate language in discussing uh, issues of today, uh, whether it's politics, philosophy, in the arts or uh, in everyday matters. But one of the problems of the Malay language besides uh, the, I guess, the, uh, I guess uh, with the coming of the English as the, um, uh, the, the, the language of the urban language, uh, the urban society is, Malay also is being seen as an exclusive language for the Malay society. Like, like 
people from other races they can't really relate themselves well with Malay language when a lot of the Malay words uh, that yeah, has to be banned. I mean, a lot of the words that is non-Malay has to be banned if it's being used in the Malay language. And not just that, um, a lot of the literature and uh, knowledge are not being appropriately translated into Malay. So it has very limited uh, usage in that sense. How, how do Buku Jalanan sort of expand in that, in that particular area? Uh, I think um, as a language of identity and a language of um, uh, social social acceptance maybe Malay has a more problematic position mm-hmm. and I think it doesn't have to be the language of uh, everyone you know like everyone identifies with Malay language I, think, I don't think is the best for the country I think it's great that we have many la- different languages that people identify with but um, l- even even with uh, Malay being seen as a the language of the Malays for example uh, it's still being used by other, other uh, for example, by the non-Malays uh, in their conversation. Uh, so it's not true that uh, Malay uh, is is only the language of the, uh, of yeah, the Malays. I mean, maybe maybe the authorities. Mm-hmm. I think they have done a great damage to the language. What they've done is they've turned uh, Malay language into the language of power, mm-hmm. the language of the author- authoritarian language that dominate people. So more and more people feel like language is, uh, sorry, Malay is the language of uh, the Malay race. Mm -hmm. And uh, you only use it when you speak to the Malays. But uh, I think what we should try and do is we should rekindle the idea of Malay as a language of uh, unity. uh, Bahasa persatuan. I think it's really important, uh, but at the same time, do not, uh, do not go into the path of trying to force everyone to speak it. I think it's wrong. Mm-hmm. So, uh, part of the activism that we do in Kujilana is to make uh, uh, Malay is seen again as a language of unity, mm-hmm. as a language that fight for not just the Malays but fight for everyone and fight for justice and the medium in which you express this uh, struggle. Mm-hmm. What are the main uh, challenges that Buku Jalanan face with uh, the local communities and with the government when you do your activities? Um, a lot of Buku Jalanan um, have fairly, have been organised fairly smoothly where we don't face uh, great uh, challenges. Uh, but I must say there have, there have been several incidents um, involving a um, few libraries, such as in Kuantan, uh, in Kuching, uh, in Seremban, where uh, the libraries have been um, told to to leave. Mm-hmm. Uh, in Kuching, for example, there were police officers and also local authority officers who uh, came and then uh, asked the Buku Jalanan librarians to pack up and leave. Mm. The reason being given was that Buku Jalanan in Kuching uh, was providing materials unsuitable <laughs> and insensitive. Of course, you're talking about Communist Manifesto <laughs> and all that. <laughs> but also other books which mm-hmm. are critical mm-hmm. of the uh, status quo and what's going on. Mm-hmm. And what, what kind of impact that Buku Jalanan hopes to make towards the local community, maybe in the next 10 years or 5 years? I think that's a very <laughs> difficult question. Um, but what we hope to do is we uh-huh. hope to bring uh, literature into the fore in mm. uh, Malaysian culture. So uh, what we hope uh, to do is to bring uh, not just the idea of reading, but the idea of debating literature, mm. debating um, our position in the world, debating politics, in a very informed manner. So that's what we wanted to do. And that's what we hope to... So final question. What is your favourite book? <laughs> I always change my favourite books. That's a problem. But so far, for for so many years, my favourite book has been uh, Arundhati Roy's um, The God of Small Things. It's a book that I discovered 
uh, by accident in Kinokuniya. I never heard of Arundhati Roy. I'm that ignorant. And then I I saw it on the uh, shelf in the, the featured shelf, featured books shelf. So I picked it up. I uh, opened the first page, and the first page was so beautiful. And I just I finished the book in like a day or two. I can't remember, but it was so quick. Wow. And after that, I discovered who she is, and uh, she's she's also an architect, uh, which I can relate to, and her activism was so inspiring, inspiring, and uh, yeah, that's my favorite book. Lovely. Thank you, Esanasan. Thank you.